Great, so um, you all know, I think, that so I've been working in different parts of tropical Africa for the last 10 years. And whereas this last course was focused on inventories, most of my time in doing field work and working with people in many different countries has not been focused on inventories. It's been focused on sampling, trying to get samples for doing um, essentially systematic. So trying to understand the diversity of species in countries and the relationships among countries. And so in a lot of cases, my sampling in the field is short because I'm going after as many individuals of particular species as I can find for doing systematics projects and describing biodiversity. So these next two days are really much closer to home for me and the research that I do a lot of the time. And so, you know, during this time, I spent a number of trips in Cameroon. So this is one of the countries I probably have the most experience working in. So just to give you an idea, for the few of you that are coming from outside of Cameroon, I wanted to give you a sense of the landscapes in which we tend to work. So this is Mountain Bomb, which is in West Region. So it's sort of northeast of us up on the Bamilake Plateau. This is a set of mountains on a plateau, more or less. Uh, this is somewhere around 1,800 meters. These are Fulani villages that are up at the top of these mountains. And, and we go out at night, there's a lot of cattle and horses up here, but we go out at night to work in these very small forested streams that are here. And even still, a lot of the mountains that we have um, in Cameroon have endemic species that are still not described as science. And during a lot of this work, I've, actually the next few slides are just pictures of doing field work with the teams, and uh, in part because there's people that a few of you will recognize. So, you know, all of the work that I've done over the last few years has involved scientists in those countries. So, Walter, this is Nono for you. Defo is Divine, 11 years ago. This is Nono again, and Marcel Tala, and both of these names will come up again in a few minutes. This is my wife uh, on Mountain Bomb. This is uh, Lovemore, and there's December. For, uh, this is in front of the Museums of Malawi and Blantyre. Uh, some of you know Eli Greenbaum. This is Chifundera Kusamba, who's a uh, um, a snake biologist that works in DRC. And last, just to show that over time the field teams have gotten bigger, but we've always had a lot of local involvement from scientists and students in our field research. And while scientists and students have been involved in different types of publications, perhaps the one field that they really haven't been that involved in is systematics and species descriptions. And what I'd hope that you'll get out of this next two days is that there's a huge opportunity for you to be involved, especially in for studying particular groups of organisms that we know that the diversity is underestimated. We haven't described everything. There's no way that even me alone could ever bother, you know, have the time to describe all the species that still remain to be described in Cameroon just for frogs. And so this really needs to be a global community effort and you are all well positioned to do this work yourselves. So for studying amphibians, this is for us a time of discovery. So I was, uh, just to show you my age, so I was born in 1979, all right? This is now. You can see that in that time frame, the number of amphibian species has more than doubled, right? In the time that Rafe finished his PhD, around 2004, 2005, we now have, what, like almost 1,300 more species. So every year as a community, we describe 160, to as much as 200 new amphibian species every year. Almost all of those are frogs, but some are salamanders, a few are Sicilians. We tend to have very few new Sicilian species. Most of those are frog species. And so just as every year, if we describe, say, an average of 160 species, in just a few years, right, we suddenly have 500 species, 1,000 more species. And this is, this is a map showing you just for amphibians to give you an idea of the hot spots of biodiversity as far as species richness. Right, so in this particular case, this is a map of the world where the red, the red is showing you the parts of the world that have the highest concentration in terms of numbers of species. So, perhaps it would be unsurprising to many of you, there's large parts of tropical South America that are incredibly rich in terms of species diversity. Even the eastern United States has a lot of amphibian diversity. This is largely salamanders. We have parts of tropical Asia, where Rafe works in the Philippines and uh, Indochina. But then within Africa, we have a couple important centers of biodiversity and we're standing in one now. And that is the area that's essentially the lower Ghanaian forest zone of eastern Nigeria, Cameroon, Gabon, Republic of Congo. But you see there's also this sort of red here in Uganda, also down here in Malawi, Zambia. 
There is actually some really isolated hot spots of diversity within Ethiopia and then out here in farther West Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone. So this is a place of incredible species richness for just this one taxon, but that's also the case when you look across birds, mammals, plants. So just to give you a sense, this is just a small snapshot of the diversity that we would find just in Cameroon. And some of these you could even find all at the same site. So we have a lot of different genera represented, a lot of different types of animals across this. And within each of these, we tend to have not only a number of species of described species within each genus, we also already know that we have many undescribed species in these same genera. And probably half of these I can tell you that there are undescribed species that are just sitting waiting to be described and because you know we all have constraints on our time, they're just not described yet, right? Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity for you to be involved and to even lead this type of work. So to give you just a sense of, this is just a few frog species only from Cameroon that have been described in the last, um, I guess, 14, 15 years. There's one Sicilian that's been described in that time period, but pretty much is all frogs for amphibians. And so, you know, they see, you can tell that they're in multiple genera, but you'll also see that, you know, there's two cardioglossus, because I've been interested in cardioglossus, although someone else described this one. I've been interested in arthroleptus. Um, a Frenchman was really interested in little tree frogs. A German was really interested in these um, aquatic frogs and so on. There's a few species of these Phrynobotrachus that have been described. And of course, what happens is that someone's interested in this particular genus, and then suddenly there's an explosion of new species describing them, and then, you know, later someone's interested in a different genus. And so that tends to be the way in which this work unfolds through time. So in the last couple days, I pulled together data that's available online and made these little plots. So currently, there's 209 species of amphibians known uh, just for Cameroon. So this really is a place of a lot of species richness, but you have similar high numbers in places like in the Albertine Rift Mountains and Uganda and West Africa. Maybe not quite as high as this in Western Africa, but still a lot of endemics. And you can see that there's, there continue to be one or a several, one to four species described for Cameroon every year. So I mean, we're continuing to put out new species descriptions. So it's a very active process. And what I'm going to show you on this plot is this is simply the year in which each species was described, right, for all 209 species plotted through time. And so this is essentially a, our species accumulation curve for Cameroon, right? This is as you went to 1900, this is how many species were described in 1950, this is how many species were described. And what you'll see is this is, this is not asymptoting, this is not suddenly having the curve go flat, right? This is, I mean, almost more or less a straight line going up. And we, this will continue to go up because we have a lot of species to describe. So the significant thing that Town mentioned is that while we've had 20 species, roughly, say, 10% of all the species diversity has been described in the last 15 years. It was only in 2009 that a Cameroonian ever participated in describing a species. And this was a paper that I wrote um, with Nono Ganwo, who was Walter's mentor, uh, Raphael Ernst and Mark Oliver Rudel, who were in Germany. So this is, this is the first time a Cameroonian has been involved in a species description, despite the fact that this is a place of incredible species richness, right? A lot of these species descriptions were um, done by Europeans. And since then, there's only been one more, right? So we've only actually ever had two Cameroonian scientists that have been co-authors on a species description for an amphibian, right? Nono is one, and Nono is at the University of Yaoundé one, and Marcel, who is a master's student with me and works on Sicilian, so you've heard me mention Marcel before, and Marcel is, you know, a master's student in, in California right now, and I'll get back to the reason that these guys have actually participated in these descriptions at the end, because it has relevance to the last four days of our course that we've spent. And so this only represents six of the 209 species, and you, you think that sounds bad, it's actually worse for reptiles. So this is one of those species accumulation curves for reptiles. You can see by roughly around the year 1900, uh, species descriptions have really slowed down. Uh, but in recent years, especially with um, new exploration done with a lot of, with Nono, with Marcel, um, and others that have been part of a camp, this project called Cam Herp that's based in Yaoundé, they've been going out and surveying different mountains. And when we do that, we find a lot of endemics to these very small places within Cameroon. So since 2000, there have been 14 species that were described, and there's actually only been one Cameroonian that's ever participated in the description, and that's Marcel. So this is for birds. 
oh, sorry, flying reptiles. So birds. Um, so this is a species accumulation curve for birds. And what you'll see is roughly by, I don't know, what is that, 1900, it stopped accumulating a lot of new species. And so this is just simply the birds that we believe to breed in Cameroon. So this is a rough list. But there's been very, very few species described from Cameroon for this group that's famous for species diversity in birds, right? So that's the reason that Town and Mark have been excited for 40 years to come to Cameroon, is because of this really remarkable richness of species in Cameroon, and yet there's never been a Cameroonian scientist that's ever participated in the systematics of that group, right? So there's a lot of opportunity for this. I mean, it's not rocket science. If Rafe and I can describe species, you can describe species. We started off knowing literally nothing, and I'm not sure that we're much better than that, but we can describe species now. It's, there's, and as Town mentioned, it's one of the most codified and structured forms of biology that we do. There is a recipe, there is a pattern, right? And actually the best species descriptions follow the same pattern again and again and again and again. So once you do it once or twice, you're good, right? You will learn how to do this. And so what we'll talk about during the next few days are the sort of the minimal requirements. What is the absolute minimum in order to make that name an available and valid name? And we'll talk about what that means. And then we'll also talk about, you know, what is the richness of information that you can put into those descriptions that make them useful, not only useful to you, but useful to the scientific community in general. And a lot of that information that you would collect and use for a species description comes from the types of things that we've just spent four days talking about. It comes from your field studies, it comes from your inventories work that you would be doing. And so the reason that people like Marcel and Nono have been involved in species descriptions is because they've also been really actively going out and doing field surveys, right? So they've actually been collecting specimens, they've been doing surveys on really hard to get to mountains. They've been taking photographs, making specimens, taking tissue samples, making audio recordings, not that much for audio recordings in Cameroon, um, but collecting all of this information that we've talked about for the last four days, those are the raw materials for species descriptions, just as they're the raw materials for doing sort of large scale analyses of species diversity and turnover between sites, they're also the pieces of information that are needed in order to write the species descriptions. And so as we walk through in the next day or so um, how to make a species description, I want you to hope and have in the back of your mind where those pieces of information come from, right? And that they are coming from your field work. And so the work that like Rafe and I do in whatever country, all of those pieces of information get brought together in order to make these species descriptions. And so the other things that we'll talk about in the next day or so that are important but are accessible to you are um, online resources. So one of the, the fundamental things that, needs, that you need for writing species descriptions is some knowledge of the other species, right? You need some knowledge of the known species diversity. So that USB um, um, key disk that I just passed around, that is actually you know, one way. There's a ton of literature on there that's useful for many groups, at least for amphibians and reptiles. And there's also a lot of resources online even for literature. So you need literature. And then the other is collections of specimens for comparisons. And this is perhaps the thing that's been the most limiting um, in Cameroon or in many countries is that there isn't a local resource of specimens that you can compare what you have to other diversity. But you know, some um, institutions in countries like Malawi has a national museum that has a collection. There are these in-country resources, these little collections that you can rely on and use as source material for describing your new species to other known species that are there, right? But a lot of scientists that have been working in parts of Africa or other parts of the world have in the very beginning little collections, private collections, that are essentially their own field collections that are not part of any institution, right? Because at this point, there is no institution to keep uh, amphibians and reptiles in Cameroon. So I think both Walter and Nono and a few others have in their house or in a university setting somewhere a small collection of jars that are, you know, the collection, and that's their reference. And so as you build it up, 
as you amass that material, eventually you have enough to sort of make a core facility, hopefully, that is associated with the institution. And those are the resources you're going to use, not only for types of, you know, basic type of work you'd be doing about biodiversity, but also about your species descriptions. So this is just to set the stage, hopefully, for the next day or two. This is accessible, and you can do this. It's, there's no magic to this. Um, and so um, if you have questions about this, um, I'd be happy to answer them now, but this is just sort of an intro um, lecture before we start into the real nuts and bolts of it. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Michael. You said that um, all of the pieces of information used in the description is actually coming from what we gather in the field. What about the issue of academic level? It doesn't matter whether... Academic level. Yes, in terms of your academic level? Yes, to participate in the description. An undergraduate to an old man can do, uh, do it. Yeah. No, I think just even, I mean, if you are, you know, in university, if you have a master's degree, if you have a PhD, no, there's nothing stopping someone from writing them. And in fact, I think this is... Some may argue with this, but I think that this is the type of science that's really accessible to many different levels because it is, there is a formula to it. And I think the, the most important part is actually just having the, the comprehensive knowledge about diversity. And that's something that you only learn through practice, right? And, you know, someone starting off that already has a PhD and has had a PhD for 10 years, they're going to basically be in the same position that you are if they're just now starting to write species descriptions, right? So I don't think that there's a constraint of academic level in terms of being able to do this work. Okay, uh, what about describing uh, a group that maybe you, you are not working on that group, but you think that this, this species is new to you? Yeah, so what about the case in which there is a you think there's a new species, but it's not your realm of expertise. Right. Yep, so that happens to, to all of us. Uh, it's happened to me with uh, earthworms. I am not an earthworm scientist, but I can tell you in certain cases that, you know, in very hard to get to places, if there's endemic frogs, there could be endemic other sorts of very small, you know, invertebrates. And so in cases like that, you have to find experts. I mean, even Rafe and I do that, Town does that. We find something that's really interesting and we think it's interesting, but we don't know enough about it. And you know, we form partnerships with people to get that diversity described. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Sure. Any others for now? There'll probably be a lot more questions as we go through the day. So, okay, great, thank you. <laughs>